Well, it's the top of the hour, so we should go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us for week 10 of the Failure to Disrupt Book Club. We're talking about the conclusion of the book um, and everything else in it that anybody wants to talk about with uh, Audrey Waters and Kevin Gannon. For those of you who are joining us uh, live, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, set the chat to panelists and attendees, and say who you are and where you're from and what connection you have uh, to this conversation. Um, and while folks are doing that, um, let's take some time to get to know Kevin. Um, so Kevin, the way we've been asking people to introduce themselves is with their ed tech story. Um, what's the what, what signature event from your own schooling or teaching um, got you interested in these kinds of topics? So I've been thinking about this. There's actually two things. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to be concise. So one is I graduated college in December of 1994. And right my last semester, I discovered Gopher, which was just this amazing, you know, as a history major, I could look books up in other universities' library card catalogs. And I thought to myself, this is totally rad. And the pinnacle of research technology, of course, you know, so ever since then, I've been really fascinated by, by tools that help us open up doors to find more geeky material, whatever that might be. Um, and, and also tools that expand access to libraries. Uh, my other, where I really became kind of immersed in this world, um, in about, I think it was 2007 or so, um, I started kind of consulting with Pearson uh, Higher Ed on their My History Lab product. Uh, they were looking to get some people from the pedagogical side to talk about how it might be used in class and things like this. And what happened was I eventually, the people I worked with were great, and I think they were mostly in it for the right reasons, but Pearson itself is, you know, this thing, right? And this is back when they were doing like super, super well. So I got brought out to two of their annual meetings, one in Orlando and one in San Diego, and, you know, addressed uh, groups of their representatives on how, you know, living, breathing college, fa like they brought, you know, here's a college faculty member. <laughs> Look, it's a <laughs> real one. <laughs> right, like in from the wild in our, in our climate control habitat. Numbers. And so the, the second um, of those annual meetings, I met the Newton people. So your, your discussion of the book of Newton was hilarious because that was totally my experience. I was like, wow, you guys are really selling this hard. Uh, and uh, it, yeah, Newton, it was very Newton weird. was this provider of sort of uh, adaptive learning at a, as a service. So almost up until that point, almost every adaptive tutoring product had been built in its own platform. And what Newton says is you write the items, you write the answers, and we'll create a back end that provides you with adaptive service. And then they made a bunch of totally unsubstantiated over the top claims about how powerful this was going to be. Um, continue. <laughs> Which, no, they got their practice for that at the Pearson meeting because all I heard was how this was going to just totally revolutionize online components to college classes, you know, from math to humanities and back again, you know, and my reaction was kind of eh. So that relationship actually went on for about three or four years. I got, you know, went to their headquarters a bunch of times, worked with some editors, wrote some material, um, was involved in the conversations about their auto grading products, uh, which I was totally not a fan of. Uh, and then, you know, Pearson and Market Churn being what it is, the people that I was working with ended up getting reassigned or whatever, and I kind of fell out of that orbit for a lot of reasons. Um, but it was a really interesting introduction to just how, how companies, you know, working with and among higher education or even education in general, take one particular aspect of a technology and just bludgeon you with it and weaponize it to the point where you almost feel like resistance is futile. You know, I called them the Borg because um, it was like, we will be assimilated, right? And so, but it was a really eye-opening experience. And it was also very interesting. You know, some of the people I worked with were great and like totally dedicated to good higher education and accessibility. But those were also people who I think were very ambivalent about their role in Pearson because Pearson is certainly not all about accessibility. So, so those are my, you know, that's kind of what, you know, I think set up some of the things that I'm really interested in thinking about and working with today was that experience 
plus it was wild going to like super nice slanky hotels and you know having all these sorts of experiences that one doesn't get in higher ed as a regular part so yeah yeah and then heading back to grand U university you right know, more <laughs> to, yeah. to, to, to you know not necessarily humble colleges are still great places but uh, not yeah. quite as swanky places to be able yeah to cer certainly less swanky than the ritz carlton in orlando for sure well, good. Well, it would be great to hear from you and Audrey, both sort of a summary of the conclusion, but kind of your take on the whole book. And I want to invite all of the folks who are here with us live um, to do uh, uh, an exercise as well. I mean, especially to those of you who have very kindly joined us um, week after week now. There's a routine that we use in a bunch of our online courses at the Teaching Systems Lab called I Used to Think, But Now I Think. Um, and the, the way you do that is that you come up with uh, one extension for each phrase. I used to think this before I read Failure to Disrupt, but now I think this, that, or the other thing. So for all of you um, who are in the chat, I would invite you to reflect on that uh, prompt. And if you want to type something in the chat to share with us in the format of I used to think, but now I think, um, it would be great to hear from you. But uh, we'll, we'll put Audrey and Kevin on the spot with that. Um, because Audrey's been here for a bunch of the last weeks, Kevin, we'll start with you. Um, what, what did you take away from the conclusion, you know, especially for anybody here who maybe has not read it yet? Um, what, you know, what's the take home message for you from failure to disrupt? And then we can figure out what's wrong or what's missing from that message. So this is kind of a cop out on your question, I think, but really what resonated with me the most throughout the entire book and certainly in the conclusion, you know, I'll put it in the form that you asked for. So I used to think, that the hype cycle for ed tech and the promises that were being made uh, were done in profound ignorance of history. Uh, and I'm trained as a historian, so very sensitive to this. But now I think that's even more true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll go with that. That, that. that the sense is, some in the 1990s and 2000s, someone should have been able to look back at the history of radio, of film, of personal computers, all of the promises made with them and be like, Come on, people. Everyone keeps saying that these things are going to profoundly change education, and they don't. Um, and boy, should we really be able to be confident kind of saying that now. Um, uh, what, what are, Audrey, having, having read and had these conversations over the whole book, and now you know, the last couple of pieces in the conclusion, what, what were some of your takeaways that, that you think are important for people to be attentive to? So uh, actually, I mean, I would say simil similarly to uh, to Kevin, the, this 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 ed tech ed tech amnesia is what I call it. This way in which people um, people who work in and around and near with ed tech seem to just forget about the past. It's like it's like a Will Smith and Men in Black with a little shiny light that all of a sudden like we've forgotten. You know, we've forgotten what happened last year let alone that. And I think that that piece is really important. But one of the things I really liked about this conclusion, and it's actually one of the reasons why I thought Kevin would be a great guest today, um, was because you kind of lay out your theory of change, right? Um, and I think that, you know, in Kevin's book, which I'll plug for him, um, his <laughs> book, <laughs> Radical Hope, which is excellent, um, really excellent. Um, he also has a theory of change. And I think it's really interesting how, of course, the ed tech um, evangelists have a theory of change as well um, that we can sort of put, that we, I think we can very easily push, push back on. But how, how do schools change and what's the direction we should be pushing them in? Um, and how do, we, how do we get there? I think is just are just really important, really important questions to, to tussle. Good. Having looked at both of them, Audrey, and then Kevin, you as well, what, how, how are the theories of change and radical hope and failure to disrupt the, the same or different? What are, what are the key sort of common components? Uh, well, I mean, I think that both would insist that the, the, the transformation is not technology, right? The, 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 the technology is not the, <laughs> you know, there's, there's that book that the editor of Wired, Kevin Kelly, wrote, What Technology Wants. Right, as though technology is has agency and makes choices and makes decisions and pushes um, pushes change, and I don't think that that bo both books say nah, uh, -uh. Um, and in fact, it's community that we should be thinking about. Um, I think that that's 
Um, that's one similarity. How about you, Kevin? Do you have? No, I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, I, and that's what struck me too is and why I like the. So, so what I really liked about the, the kind of conclusion here is it's a very non-sexy argument, right? Like change is incremental, change involves, you know, such radical concepts like, hey, let's talk to each other and make sure we really want to do these things, right? Like those are hard sells, but that's how change takes place, you know, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that it, it, it almost sounds counterintuitive and I love tech. I'm a tech I'm a device geek. I love all this shit, right? But, you know, I think really what EdTech does in many ways is it doesn't open anybody's imagination. It actually constrains our choices, right? And so when we're presented with like, here are all these tools that will help affect change. And then all of a sudden we start conceiving of change as something that can only be affected through the use of technology or a particular technology that has certain affordances and certain capabilities and, then, and not on the other side. So we actually put blinders on. Uh, and then we talk about change as if there's this sort of, you know, a scale effect that the more technology is used, the more dramatic the change is. And, you know, we're, and this is where we get into the idea of disruption, right? Like, you know, disruption, I've always been fascinated by the fact that, you know, it's, it's not a word with extraordinarily positive connotations for learning, yet everyone wants to disrupt learning, right? And so... Right, the disruptors were like the right. Romulans' weapons, that, like the banned weapons that the Romulans had. Exactly, <laughs> right? And it's like just The like, Federation decided there would be no disruptors, because that's like the worst possible thing. That's right, you can't, you know, and so it undoes everything, right? You know, and so I think what I really, Kind of resonated and held with this conclusion was that even though it's swimming against a really strong tide in terms of what we think is important culturally uh it's an argument that we have to keep making um because i mean you know as audrey talks about clearly you know it hasn't taken right about a year-to-year -year sort of renewal of the hype cycle that we see here but it's also one it's a profoundly important one for when we try to advocate for things like students and the resources that we need to work with with and among students well right because some of those resources get sucked up into these you know tools or databases or things like that as opposed to like hey maybe we could hire a couple adjuncts in the full-time lines and use the technological affordances we already have but this would be a more profound change in the student experience than any sort of you know algorithmic driven tutoring service that we could buy right for just using as examples um, so I think techs, the, the insidious effect of ed tech and of the hype cycle in particular is that it profoundly limits our vision of what is possible. Uh, and, and, we, and then we can't imagine alternatives without ed tech. And that's where I think we get into a really dangerous place. You know, Kevin, hearing that, I see your argument operating on two levels. One level is the kind of like rhetorical level. So we come to believe that tech is the source of the change. But I also think there's a real, you know, mechanical on the ground level of like, we invest in these systems and put a bunch of sunk costs into them. You know, we've, we've spent X million dollars to be able to do a system-wide learning management system implementation. And we set up the sort of like standard course shell across all of our courses. And now we all just have to use that, you know, whether, whether it's for a poetry class or a chemistry class or whatever it is, you know, so like because we've put all of this investment in this particular form of education technology, we're, I, I, that idea of having our choices constrained rather than expanded um, seems powerful. And Gardner in the chat has a nice contribution, I think, to this. I used to think that the limitations of technology in schools and classrooms was a function of teachers, time, limitations, and fear. Now I think that teacher suspicion has actually saved us from some of the educational industrialization that would not really serve us. You know, there's like one co-story to the story of disruption is the idea that like, wow, we could really do these tremendous things, except these conservative teachers in the classrooms kind of stuck in the past, not letting us change anything we're doing. Um, and, and, and opens up this alternative story which is no these folks who are bringing more skepticism um, are are you know not necessarily trying to prevent things from getting better they're just questioning whether or not the approach that we're taking um, is actually leading to folks getting better um, which I, which I think is a 
is a nice modification. I don't know, are there, are there, are there thoughts on that kind of um, conservatism or skepticism that, that's worth holding on to? I think that's so important because I do think that the, that is the story that you have heard historically and that you still hear to, to this day is that um, teachers are Luddites, um, that, they're, that they're the ones who are, you know, um, are preventing change rather than actually, you know, one of the other pieces I liked, you know, is you lay out really clearly in the conclusion that school, and you're talking about K through 12 school, but it, it holds for higher ed too. There are a myriad of purposes and often competing purposes, um, functions um, that, school, that schools meet. These are complex, complex systems. And so when, when technologies aren't adopted, you know, it's just the narrative is, is too neat to be able to say, ah, it's, you know, it's because of this particular, um, this particular uh, profession, which just happens to be the largest unionized profession, and mostly female in K through 12 um, uh, worker. So I think, yeah, I'm, I love hearing people who want to push back on that idea that it's the teacher's fault um, that disruption hasn't happened. You know, one commonality that I think we might have in our approaches, Kevin, Chantal kind of points to this. I used to think that ed tech was all about the tech, but now I think it is about its ability to change my interaction with the subject. I mean, one of the things that I try to argue in the conclusion is like, all right, so maybe technology doesn't um, transform things the way that evangelists would hope. Um, but it also, we shouldn't just take all conservatives and all skeptics among the faculty um, you know, uh, uh, we, we shouldn't just acknowledge immediately they're right, because one of the cool things that you can do with technology, I mean, probably the reason why I have stayed in the field so long is that it does seem to be a sort of unique lever for opening up new conversations. I mean, I think your first story points exactly to that. Um, Kevin discovers, discovers Gopher. We discover this kind of new way of engaging with historical disciplinary study. And all of a sudden we're like, hey, maybe there are some really good and different things that we could do here. I, I mean, how much for you, Kevin, in your work, do you see technology as playing this kind of catalyzing role of generating new conversations about what better teaching and learning might be able to look like? I think that the, I mean, I, I, I can say that it's interesting to, to think about um, the way in which technology opens these questions, but I think that, um, for better or for worse. I think that the pandemic has also really prompted us to have um, these questions with, with and without the technological component, right? Um, what are we expecting people to do as students? What do we expect teachers to do as teachers? What does that look like? Um, and what does that look like uh, now that I think a different set of eyes are maybe on the classroom than were pre-pandemic? Right. Yeah, literally parents literally, eyes, yeah. family members eyes. Yeah. Um, what uh, are there sp are there specific conversations that are happening now, Audrey, or like specific sites of those conversations or specific like, what through lines of that should we follow or pay attention to, do you think? Um, you know, I think that it's for me it's been interesting to watch sort of how the narratives around teachers have changed since February, March. <laughs> Um, the sort of realization early on that teachers were all heroes and should be making a million dollars, right, in the first few weeks when parents were attempting to do remote or to at least manage their, their children's remote. I've been trying to teach my child math for two hours, and now I think every teacher should be paid a million dollars. Yep, exactly. I, I remember those tweets for you know, like <laughs> a week and a half in March. <laughs> yes, and, and it, but then things, then things changed, and I think that we saw over the summer um, and even into the fall, I think a lot more critical um, and I think sort of um, pretty negative sentiments towards towards teachers. Why are teachers, ref you know, why are teachers refusing to go back to school, for example? Why are teachers refusing to play their usual role as picking up all the slack left by the state and the community, right? Yeah. I had a really interesting conversation with a principal in Yakima, Washington. Um, and I was giving a talk to a group of educators and I was saying, one of the most unfortunate things of the pandemic um, is that uh, 
you know, municipalities, states should have had a much, much bigger role in preserving the social safety net. And instead, society basically turned to schools and said, can you do the teaching and learning, but can you also keep everyone fed and be frontline healthcare workers and find housing for kids who don't have it and basically like be our social safety net. Um, and, and this principal in Yakima said, but we should do that. That's our role. Like we need, like we needed to do that to take care of these kids. And I, you know, I was, I said to him, please maintain that attitude as an educator. Like, please believe that you can make an enormous difference and that you can tackle all these challenges. And then as a citizen, like put a lid on that and realize that there's a kind of negative feedback loop of teachers being like, yep, we'll take, yep, we're totally overwhelmed, but I guess we'll take that on too because no one else is doing it um, because it sort of, you know, it, it reshapes the conversation, you know, so that Jeb Bush can do an op-ed in the Washington Post, which says um, schools really need to make sure during the pandemic that we're providing internet access for children. Um, which is, of course, a, you know, on the one hand, it's like absolutely true. You know, schools should dole out every hot spot they can. You know, we just found out this week that there might be 60,000 kids in New York City who are um, doing remote schooling with paper packets because they don't have technology, they don't have connected to the internet. Um, but, uh, but by the same token, it's completely absurd to think that the overburdened New York City Department of Education should be responsible for running new fiber optic cable into you know, housing projects and homeless shelters and those kinds of things. Like there, there has to be other parts of society that step in to take care of, of students and families. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think the, the pandemic, um, I, I mean, gosh, we're, you know, the, I, I guess I guess part of that sort of twin stories is like to what extent will the pandemic be a kind of awakening moment where we sell, um, you know, goodness gracious, like um, you know, there's so much more that society needs to do to take care of kids, or will we leave the pandemic with the message like that was pretty bad, but teachers kind of held it together, so you know they probably will next time. And the tech sucked. The tech sucked, but what are you gonna do? We gotta have ed tech. Right. <laughs> and yay teachers, but they still complain too much and we still vaguely dislike their unions because reasons, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, what's, what's a, so I have two kids, right? One junior high, one high school doing remote schooling through Des Moines public schools, you know, and it's just been, I mean, our school district has just done amazing yeoman work on this. You know, our, our all volunteer school board is trying to navigate, you know, basically the complete institutional failure of everybody around us, right? But, you know, we, so teachers are communicating with us, schools are communicating with us. As a parent, I'm totally digging this, right? But by the same token, like most of these communications are like meal pickup and the logistics of getting kids who are on free and reduced lunch, like the family food that they need and how to, you know, and, and it's, again, it's, it's just, unre the pandemic has just laid bare all, you know, how faulty most of the assumptions we had about what educators are doing and should be doing in our society, just like how unsustainable that is. And, you know, for about two weeks in the spring, there was that window of hope, but now it just seems like, you know, we're over that, right? And it's, this whole neoliberal idea that, you know, we could just sort of, you know, contract all this stuff out, you know, the basic functions of civil society and somehow keep stumbling along and being successful is, and, and someone will help us disrupt our way out of it as soon as we figure out the right tool with which to do so. You know, to me that just, you know, it just, it's fantasy. Uh, it's absolutely ludicrous fantasy. And I don't know what the answer to that is, but I sort of felt like I wanted to say it. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Well, I'm also glad you brought up school board meetings. I definitely feel like some of the most hopeful, or some of the moments of gratitude that I've most had over the last few months have been sitting in on a couple of different towns, school board meetings. Yeah, as you mentioned, like unpaid volunteers who assumed that they were going to, you know, be managing like a plus or minus 3% change in the budget and like helping make sure that the superintendent was connected to community and like maybe rehiring that person eventually suddenly finding themselves in the midst of these incredibly difficult gut wrenching decisions. Um, you know, I, as I understand it, there are more, the, the, the modal elected school official, the modal elected official in the United States is a school board member. There are more people elected to be school board members than any other elected position in the United States. Um, and I think you're exactly right that they've made, uh, um, you know, extraordinary efforts and extraordinary contributions during a difficult time. Um, 
So one of the structures that's in the conclusion, you know, it aspires to be a kind of a bit of a how to, you know, the title is um, preventing the next or, you know, preparing for the next learning at scale hype cycle. Uh, so I offer this series of questions. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit inspired by the sort of Atul Gawande-esque checklist kind of mentality, like, okay, so there's a new technology. Um, what are the questions that we ought to ask for it? Um, and it starts with what's really new here um, and then continues into, into other kinds of details of that. Who controls the learning? What's the role of assessment? Um, how are the communities being prepared? Those kinds of things. Um, what, what was your take on these eight questions? Are there, are, there, are there questions that you would take away from that list? Are there questions you would add to that list? I was curious if you could say a little bit more about the what existing technologies does this adopt? Because um, I was thinking, does this, I was thinking about like, what did you mean by um, existing technologies? Do you mean, does this, do, are we just using Google Docs, which is uh, enterprise tech system, or are you talking about technologies maybe in different ways? What existing practices does this adopt? I think I did mean technologies in the sense that most new ed tech being sold is not made of de novo new technology. So, you know, Newton is a great example of this. Um, Newton's founders were sort of out there saying, we have created the brand new algorithm driven learning as a service. This is totally revolutionary. And then their engineers were making blog posts that were like, here's how we use uh, two parameter item response theory models to be able to make these predictions. And these models you know, were made in the 1970s, 1980s by educational testing service. Um, and, you know, and Newton had more data per person um, than the educational testing services people did. But, you know, but, the, but the sort of core technology at the heart of Newton was not a thing that was new. It was a thing that had been built a, a long time ago. Um, and, you know, I, I think similarly, um, you know, a, a, the, a, a bunch of the auto grading tools that we have, like, are not that different from the ones that were programmed into the Play-Doh learning systems in the 1960s and the 1970s. So, you know, almost every education technology software is kind of an amalgamation of, you know, all software to some extent is an amalgamation of a bunch of different things, a bunch of um, services and calls and libraries um, that have been developed before. And so, so part of, I think, the routine that I'm asking people to try to do is to look at this thing and like flip through and look at the individual parts of it. You probably don't need to go like go down to the code level and see, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, JavaScript libraries are being reused, but to be like, okay, so that's an auto grader. Like, is this auto grader really any different than any of the auto graders that have existed for the past 20 years, the past 60 years? Um, and most folks being able to say, uh, um, you know, no, there, there are things here that we recognize and there may very well be things that are new and the thing, you know, but the things that are new are likely to be this big rather than this big. That's what I was trying to get at perhaps. Well, this also, this also ties into Kevin's point earlier. I think that once you start making certain decisions and investing quite literally in certain technologies, then the new pieces, they're like puzzle pieces. It's like those have already circumscribed what you can do next, right? The way in which you know, the development of the learning management system was really circumscribed by the development of the student information system that it was built on top of. And so we're building all of these new pieces onto, you know, we're just like hacking things onto the learning management system these days, or I guess onto Zoom or whatever. Um, but, that, but those are already circumscribed by, the, by those previous technologies, which harken back to like some really old database stuff from, you know, um, the student information system is, um, and if you've ever talked to people who run the student information systems at your university or school, I mean, it's, it's clunky. <laughs> My yeah. wife runs ours. <laughs> and yeah, and, and then, you know, it interfaces with Blackboard. We're a Blackboard school. And so this is how classes get populated. And so like, you know, what this looks like in operation is right now, you know, I'm, I direct our teaching and learning center and we're responsible. And by we, I mean, basically me and an instructional technologist, Blackboard admin person. And, uh, you know, we're responsible for online and high flex training, development, tech support, all of that. And so the administration has said, you know, we're going to use the standard course shell, which I hate, but here I am having to copy it into people's classes. And when we did this pivot in March, you know, all my colleagues in the humanities are like, what the 
fuck is this? Like, I can't teach with, you know, like just literally, you know, pulling their hair out, you know, and, and I was on a Zoom meeting where one person started doing that, right? And it was because it's so foreign, it's so alien to the way that they are conceiving of, you know, the learning outcomes for their class and the, and the vehicles that they want to take to get there. You know, so with the questions that you pose in the conclusion, you know, one of the things that resonated with me was, you know, you're, you're making reference to, you know, what is, what is this embodying pedagogically speaking, right? And so, you know, the, the refinement on that I would have for one of these questions is what pedagogical choices does this particular thing promote and what choices does it take off the table? Right. Because if I'm teaching a traditional seminar based class, you know, Zoom is basically the only technology I need to do that in a synchronous way. If I can't be in my physical classroom, I don't necessarily need something to be managed, you know, but if I am doing something like auto graded quizzes with adaptive release where students can level up in terms of their ability to solve a particular type of equation or problem. Yeah, then let's talk about that. Uh, but, you know, Education is a complex system. Colleges and universities are complex systems with, you know, varying needs. And, and, you know, all too often we make decisions based on, I would argue, based more on the needs of STEM fields than anything else when it comes to ed tech, because mm -hmm. there's already a shared language, I think, there. Uh, and those of us in the humanities haven't always played well with technology, and we've been kind of visibly curmudgeonly about it. And I think that that has shifted the narrative a little bit in terms of the way that resources get allocated when it comes to, you know, digital materials, digital spaces, digital tools uh, to help us create good learning spaces for our students. And I think we're really seeing that divide in these, you know, pandemic and uh, pandemic induced remote teaching times. And what, you know, what an interesting kind of feedback loop that you're proposing uh, of something along the lines of um, one group of stakeholders say, this is the kind of technology that we want. Another group of stakeholders says, that's not really the kind of technology we want and the kind of tech, we actually don't need that much technology. Um, and then sort of IT staff like implement those, you describe them as STEM ideas, um, but they also implement them on the humanities people or on other people who weren't primary to the conversation. And they go, no, 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 wait. And so then, you know, they feel compelled to, you know, it's like a point they might want to make is like, how do we very selectively choose only a few of these pieces to bring in, but instead they're sort of forced into a conversation which is more like okay now that we are completely surrounding these learning experiences with technology which isn't what we want in the first place but now we have to jump into these conversations um, because if we don't um, then you know uh, the people who aren't at the table are are not going to have their their input included um, but it's a, but it's a way that that sort of more people are forced to be attentive to these issues even if you know, it's kind of not, you know, their, their first nation is to try to be more, more skeptical and more conservative. And there's never student voice that's involved in any of these decisions, right? And, and that's so we're expecting, you know, the, the primary audience for like the sales pitch for an LMS or something like that is towards faculty and the IT administrators, the LMS administrators. And like, here's all the things that will help you do better and more efficiently. You know, it will help you create spaces that are more organized. It'll help you do these kinds of assessments. And there's never anything in this rhetoric about it's going to help students do better, right? The assumption is, is that the faculty implements something profession or, uh, proficiently, then the students will automatically learn better. And if they don't learn better, then it's certainly not a design flaw or disciplinary difference. You just must not have implemented the solution, right? Like that's... Yeah, I think that's part of your hype cycle, right? Like this tool is going to solve your problems. It didn't solve your problems, but you know, no one asked the students, you know, how, how they experienced that tool from the user end of it. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, that's a real, I'll say one other example. So in COVID, you know, we, um, my institution decided to adopt a COVID tracking app. Uh, which was, you know, all sorts of problematic in terms of its privacy implications, but no one talked to any students about it. Uh, and so the student life staff and our administration made this decision on this app and then required our student athletes to download it and enter in all this, you know, personal health information and use this app. And they were just, you know, there were two problems. One, they were like, hell no, with all this, you know, information stuff. And then the second is, 
it was such a screwy app. The interface was awful. The UX, you know, so they were like, we cannot literally use this. And so we abandoned it after two weeks, which, you know, goes to show, right? Like, you know, what are the pitfalls of, and, you know, out, and we allocated a significant amount of CARES Act money to that. Uh, so anyway, that's, you know, student voice is sadly missing from, you know, this resource allocation, especially when you're locked into something that's going to give you sunk costs, right? I think that students, students, or I think that many people imagine that the, that students are being included because they use words like student success. They imagine what students want, and then of course, what they imagine students want is that to, for students to graduate in four years and get a good job. Like that's kind of the, it's kind of the extent. So I think that people do imagine that students are included, and I think it ties back to some of the things that we talked about previously that. There's also the ima imagining what students are like when these tools are being constructed. And I think, you know, it's that phrase that um, Tracy McMillan Cotton has, right? The roaming autodidact mm -hmm. um, that we sort of, it's, that students aren't, um, and it, perhaps it ties into sort of who becomes the engineers um, for these products as well. Um, are they from, you know, are they from humanities backgrounds? Are they from Ivy League schools? Where, um, but sort of what this, what those, what those people even imagine the student experience to look like, and what those folks I think imagine what the students want. Um, you know, I think you know Sarah Goldrick Rob reminds us like they would like food. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> students are hungry, right? Mm -hmm. Students are homeless. Um, students are really struggling, and and that's not the kinds of things that ed tech even begins to imagine. And that's because that's the just, students that ahead. matter at schools like mine. Right. And schools like mine aren't the big accounts that are, you know, we're not going to do a system wide adoption to make you a ton of money. You know, we've got 1500 FTEs. And so, you know, we'll pay you 20 grand a year for Blackboard, but that's just a drop in the bucket. Right. But this is, you know, my institution is where you have students who are living in their cars, students who can't get basic needs met, you know, students who are working three jobs and need some sort of technical solution to help them manage this workload but they're not in those conversations about the tools that we have available to us to adopt. I don't know what the solution to that is, um, but I do, I don't think it's, you know, Ivy League graduates, you know, designing these products that look like the app students use so they're more comfortable with it. Like, I don't think that's the answer. Yeah, I think part of the answer is sort of uh, political and, and part of the answer is about professional ethics, or at least those are sort of two of the kinds of things that I was, that I'm trying to advocate for within failure to disrupt is something like, um, yeah, there's, there's nothing within technology that will make the technology more student-centered, more accountable to student needs. What will make technology more accountable to students' needs is educators organizing um, and saying, look, we're not going to make these choices without listening to students. Like, we're going to find some way in our internal political processes to include student voice. Um, but then at the other level, um, you know, going to venture capitalists, going to the philanthropists, governments who support these things and saying, as you're funding teams, are you asking them questions about who is at the table? Um, who is on your board of advisors? You know, what people have you hired onto your team um, that went to places like Grandview University that went to America's urban school systems and not to the exam schools, but to the other neighborhood schools, um, you know, um, what, uh, um, you know, in, in, as uh, one of my colleagues said, you know, institutions where the top 100% of students go to. Um, and uh, so here, here's another question that's come up in, in the chat that I would love to get both of your perspectives on. Um, you know, Marion brought this up saying, um, we have some of the technologies we want to use, and yet most of the technologies in the book are, are about technology, not about learning and how people learn. Do we need to abandon the current approach to teaching and learning and try something new? Les Falto says, um, you know, my proposed subtitle for the book is traditional pedagogy consistently limits the power of technology. Um, I think Lourdes Martin um, says something similar, you know, which is that there might be some neat things that we could do with technology around personalization or other kinds of things, but the technology can't do that itself. Um, lots of things need to change together with the technology. Um, and, you know, in your 
teaching and learning center or in your other work, Kevin, like how ambitious are you as to the degree to which institutions can make big changes about how they do teaching and learning? Um, you know, to one of the through lines of the book is that education systems are just conservative systems. Um, how much should we realistically expect of them to be able to make big changes pedagogically, organizationally to serve students better? So I think the way I would answer that question is to, is to make a, a, contra a contrast between kind of the impetus for change or the willingness to do that kind of change and the sort of structural systems around that limit that change. And so here's what I'm thinking, right? So, you know, it's often the case that people will say, well, you know, college faculty were never trained how to teach. We never learn anything about pedagogy and graduate programs. And so we're wedded to the lecture model. And, and I think that's true to an extent. But with the proliferation of teaching and learning centers throughout the country, I mean, faculty development's been a field for the last 40 years, at least, right? And we know, and there's been a ton of work on the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, institutions know, and if they don't, they have no excuse about what's effective teaching and learning and what isn't. And we know that the 200 person, 300 person lecture is not effective learning. And so the faculty member who's teaching that course, it's not that they want to teach that course that way. It's they have to right because this is where the resources have been allocated we're looking for budget efficiencies and so we want to put one faculty f you know a full-time faculty line with 250 students because that's the space we have and that's the personnel budget we have and so when we talk about change you know how do we disrupt that pattern you know one of my first teaching gigs was at university of houston uh, where i was a visiting faculty member um replacing an older professor who used to spew vile racist epithets at his classes. So apparently after a year or so that didn't fly anymore. And so I come in brand new to everything and he's teaching 490 person lectures in this vast cavernous auditorium. You know, that's completely the wrong way to teach, but I had no choice yep. in terms of what pedagogy I'm using. So how do, is it the university? Is it the system that's not going to change? Or is it the model of funding that we have for higher education that mandates decisions like this? You know, I think institutions have some wiggle room. You know, what does the administration see as a priority? Our mission may emphasize teaching and learning. Well, our budget should follow that mission, right? You know, if we know that 300 person lectures aren't the optimal way, how are we trying to undo that as much as we can? There is some room there, but only some. And so it becomes less of a, you know, how do we implement technologies? You know, right now the decisions on implementing technologies are how do we make this huge lecture based form of pedagogy more efficient and easier to grade for grad students, basically. Those aren't the right questions, but we can't ask the questions we want to ask if we're stuck in this larger funding model that dictates warehouse classrooms, uh, you know, for pretty much every hundred level course we offer. I, you know, and I think some, I think there's a similar kind of argument in K-12 too that's made particularly powerful in the pandemic, you know, which is something like, there's no reason why the last nine months had to unfold the way they did. There's certainly no reason why the last three months had to unfold the way they did. Um, we could have made big investments in school systems like we made big investments in airlines, like we made big investments in banking and financial institutions to be able to um, you know, substantially increase the number of staff who are supporting teaching and learning. Um, you know, there's all kinds of folks, you know, one of, one, of, one of the most straightforward arguments that has been out there has been something like, you know, we know tutoring works. If a bunch of kids are missing school time, um, we, we reasonably know well how to take, you know, volunteers, underemployed people and train them up to help folks, you know, get more individualized attention. Um, and, it, you know, it's simply a matter of making those kinds of investments. So I do, I do think, you know, um, I mean, to me, and I, you know, and I, and I hear in your language, um, you know, similar dilemmas that I face, which is something like, okay, as an educator, I just walk into that 490 person classroom and I do the very best job I can for those 490 students who are there. And I use the, the best technologies and the other resources that are most available and do what we can. And then as a citizen, you gotta say, okay, this is totally unacceptable and we need to come up with some other set of solutions um, for addressing this. And some of what addressing this is gonna involve changing the way that we fund um, K-12 and higher education so that students can have better and richer experiences. Um, Audrey, what are, your, what are your thoughts on this? What are, what's your sort of optimism or pessimism for, um, you know, for academic new deals or for tackling some of these bigger questions? Um, 
Boy, you want me to be optimistic. I well, didn't say optimistic. <laughs> I, I, I asked for you do that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I do think that if we want, if this country, I'll speak to, you know, this very US focused answer, but if this country wants to continue to be able to take any sort of pride in its higher education system, but also um, to continue to, to be the kind of economy, um, we're gonna have, we're gonna have to change the way in which we fund, in which we fund school. Um, I would say that I am um, hopeful that something is gonna be done about student loan debt, but again, if we don't change the way in which students have to fund their, their higher education, then I'm not sure that that's the kind of massive structural change that we need to see, but I think that, I think that things have to change. I think it's, like, I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, it's gonna be really interesting to see what the new um, Secretary of Education does about standardized testing um, this spring. You know, the priorities, priorities for a very long time have been in doing, you know, going, running through, running through students through the paces for the standardized testing. And this is a moment, again, where we can do something different. We've seen a lot of schools say, maybe we're not going to look at the SATs anymore, you know. Um, uh, and a lot of K-12 school systems say there's going to be another year, or at least another, a lot of K-12 school systems saying we didn't do our testing regime last year. Um, you know, the sky didn't fall. Maybe we shouldn't do it again this year. Um, and, uh, you know, and I do think it opens up a bunch of imaginations of like, huh, so, okay, if we didn't do that, you know, what would right. we use as that? What would we do? Yeah. What would yeah. we imagine uh, uh, otherwise? Um, but the other, the other piece of the, the is I would say the, the sky didn't fall. I mean, and it is in some ways uh, the counter to the call for incremental change is that things are really bad. And things are really bad for a lot of students, um, not just because of the pandemic, but certainly it's been exacerbated. Um, and things are pretty bad for a lot of teachers and adjunct instructors in particular in higher ed. And something, you know, something has to happen now. Um, I don't know if we want to sort of wait for things to kind of a little bit course correct and for the, you know, is there a point where we have to be um, more um, radical with the things that we demand schools, um, these institutions do? Um, you know, what, is that, what does that look like? Um, I, I think that is amongst the most compelling arguments against incrementalism. You know, I sort of feel like the case in favor of, you know, the pandemic pre presents both a powerful case in favor of and against incrementalism. The case in favor of it is something like, look around at what's happening and the extraordinarily conservative response of K-12 and higher education institutions. I mean, the number of institutions that have like actually taken this moment as an opportunity to do something even modestly different is in my view quite small, um, you know, shockingly small. Um, and, uh, but I think, you know, and so, and so one view is to say like, look, descriptively, these places change slowly. Let's accept the fact that they change slowly and keep our shoulders to the wheel of trying to make sure that slow change is heading in the right direction. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think a powerful counter argument is something like, um, but this is totally untenable um, and inequitable. And it's, and it's not what our communities are capable of doing as communities or as a society. Like we can pull together and do better than this. Like there are points of light out there. We know how um, and we should follow them. Well, we have just a couple minutes left um, and we got a terrific suggestion from Ann Gardner, um, which is uh, before the three of you leave, can you each recommend the next book? Um, let me put Audrey on the hook for recommending Kevin's book. Um, Audrey, why should Radical Hope be the next book that we read? Um, you know, for me, I think it was, um, oh, I, I, oh, I will say, I really like any book that's got manifesto in the subtitle, just politically, I find that to be really <laughs> compelling. <laughs> um, but I just felt it was, um, for me, uh, particularly as someone who, um, uh, what is it, I, I am a pessimist because of intellect and an optimist because of will, is what Gramsci would say. Um, but I, I thought it was, um, it was optimistic, um, politically optimistic in a really powerful way. And um, yeah, I, I wholeheartedly recommend the book. Kevin, do you, do you have a recommendation for a next book to take on? 
Well, first, let me thank Audrey for those really kind words, because that means a lot. Um, you know, so when Audrey's book is out, <laughs> you should definitely read that, because that's the history that informs these things, right? That, and, and a lot of what you wrote, Justin, when you explored that resonated with some of the, the work of, of Audrey's that I'd read before, so I really liked the way that that kind of deepened my context. Um, the other book I would recommend to um, John Warner, uh, who writes, uh, who's on Twitter is Biblioracle, um, and he writes the Just Visiting column at Inside Higher Ed. Um, he has a new book out through Belt Publishing, a small publishing house in the upper Midwest, uh, on the future of higher education. Um, and I think he calls it, what does he call it? Uh, sustainable, I resilient, free. That's the one. Sustainable, resilient, free, the future of public higher education. And even as someone who works in a small private institution, um, I have found that book uh, enormously provocative and sort of generative and reflective of uh, the type of conversations that we need to be having. Um, you know, it's a good table setter, uh, I think, into that. Um, so that's the book I would, you know, we need to be, I think, you know, as you, we need to be addressing these big, you know, change may come incrementally, but that doesn't mean we can't be asking the big questions. Uh, and if we're not asking the right questions, then we're just going to sit and spin our wheels. So I, I am all about someone, let's, let's put those questions on the table, take an unflinching look at where we are, so we can better discern where it is we want to go. Um, I think maybe a great companion piece to that kind of thing um, in K-12 is a book by my colleague at MIT, Peter Senge, and a bunch of his colleagues, sort of a community text called Schools That Learn. Um, so Peter Senge wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline, um, which I think is one of the great management tasks about how organizations go through big changes. He, he coined this term called the learning organization in which he was talking about firms of all kinds, you know, the oil refineries and people that make sneakers and things like that. But I think it applies powerfully to schools that when, when great organizations are doing their work, they're accomplishing their goals, but also everyone is learning and growing at the same time. And that's how institutions become greater. And then he, he with a bunch of colleagues wrote this book called Schools That Learn that both further explores that idea, but then also gives a bunch of concrete guidance of like, here are the kinds of things that we could do um, to be able to make progress in, in that direction. Um, well, Kevin Gannett, it's been an absolute treat uh, getting a chance to have you join us here for our last meeting. Thank you. Thanks for having me and for, you know, for the book. Uh, it's, I've already given copies of it to my provost and deans, so they have assignments over Thanksgiving break that they're supposed to read it, and then we're going to have a discussion group on my campus. So <laughs> More homework. So, that was my right. <laughs> well, And Audrey Waters. Doing. <laughs> Audrey Waters, the last 10 weeks have been such a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me. Really looking forward to doing this for, for your book, Teaching Machines. Yep, thank you. That's been great.